Good evening um, to those in the audience, as well as those watching us from this sort of contiguous time zone. Good morning, good afternoon for those watching from elsewhere in the world, or I'm sure re-watching at a later point. My name is Martin Spoprinskis. I'm a reader in public international law here at UCL, and for tonight, I'm very, very pleased and honored uh, to be the chair of Dan Marie Ammon's talk, No Exit at Nuremberg. Uh, I will be brief with my introductory remarks. Uh, we have a really extraordinary speaker with us uh, tonight. Uh, Dan is a professor at the University of Georgia, a spectacularly uh, impressive scholar of public international law in various fields, particularly international criminal law and international criminal justice. And she also has experience with the International Criminal Court. I think I could really go on and on explaining her uh, CV, but I think that you're probably more interested in hearing what she has to say. Google always will tell us of what she has already done. Um, the topic is no exit at Nuremberg, the post-war order as stage of, for the 21st century global insecurity. And as, as the abstract outlines, it is a hugely important topic for the structure of the international legal order and unfortunately something of great uh, current uh, topicality. Uh, before I give the floor to Diane, let me just say a few housekeeping rules. Diane will speak for about half an hour and then we have a solid half an hour questions and answers. I will take variously our questions from the audience present. And you can also submit questions via the online. So I'll try to be equally responsive to the local and the global audience. So don't be shy with asking questions in either fashion. With introductions made, Diane, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Martins, and thanks to all of you for attending. I'm delighted uh, at your interest in this topic. I'd also like to thank University College London and Kat uh, Balagun, who has, and Matt in the back, who have so kindly made this possible. Um, as, as Martins has mentioned, my topic today is no exit at Nuremberg, um, the post-war order as stage for 20th 21st century global insecurity. It is a talk that I've been working on that ranges across a couple of disciplines and a number of different uh, uh, baskets of research that I'm doing. One of them, of course, is uh, the work that I'm doing um, that I hope to focus on in my time here as a visiting academic. I am writing a, what will be the first book on uh, women who were lawyers or otherwise professionals at the first Nuremberg trial. Um, this is research that I've been doing for quite a while. At one, thought I at one time, I thought I would do all the Nuremberg trials. I'm happy to report that uh, my research has turned up enough qualitative, uh, interesting, captivating information about uh, just the women at the very first trial that I feel comfortable I can tell that narrative in a much more coherent way. And so I'm focusing, as you can see, on six women um, who are chosen uh, in part because they represent at least one of each of the four major uh, allies, as they called themselves, the US, the UK, uh, Russia, and France, who were the leaders, but by no means the only national participants at Nuremberg. And uh, there is at least one person from each of those nationalities, as well as a woman who was born into a Jewish family in Germany, had to flee about the time of Kristallnacht, went to the United States uh, with her family, got a degree at Berkeley, and came back as an interpreter. So in some ways, her story adds the, the texture of the Jewish community and, and one of the more notable victim populations to the story. I'm going to talk about this a little bit 
but more to draw out of the research some things that seem very germane to the moment we're in. Um, this idea that, that Nuremberg is more than uh, a trial. It's more than uh, the fountainhead of international criminal law and some of the other things you've said. My claim is that it is a cornerstone, indeed in some ways an emblem of the post-World War II moment. There was a heck of a lot more going on there than there was uh, uh, than just a trial. And um, this, as Martin said, this, this set of insights, if you will, is important or feels important at this moment because Europe is again at war. And as we all know, uh, the war is, I believe, in its 111th day today. The estimates are something like um, uh, 40,000 deaths, half of them Ukrainian combatants, half of them Russian combatants, and then 4,000s of, 4, of them civilians. Those are all probably very low numbers, and you can imagine exponentially adding on uh, injuries short of death to that. And then the displacement numbers are just phenomenal. In a country that last year had a population of 44 million, 14 million people have been displaced. Half of them leaving the country altogether as refugees, half of them internally displaced. And so part of what I'll try to do is, is, is draw some threads between those two things. It's also significant because we now know, thanks to one of the members of your faculty in some part, that there is serious talk about another tribunal that is being called another Nuremberg Tribunal that doesn't fit within the jurisdictional pieces that have been laid out, um, in part because there's a serious desire to talk about aggression. And so that allows us to consider and look more at the Nuremberg moment, not as a simple, oh, well, we're talking history. I, I did the, a talk in Lyon to uh, young undergraduates a few months ago, and one of them raised her hand in, in French and said, why should we care about this? Right? Well, that was before the war and before some of these questions, even to young undergraduates who don't care much about law, started to feel more important. Um, one of the things, if I had to think of a way of organizing this that begins to sound disciplinary, one of the things that's really interesting to me in my research is objects. What can things tell us, whether they're texts like treaties, photographs, postcards, um, different sorts of things like that? Sometimes themselves can give us feeling about a moment. Indeed, I have tried to visit most of the places I'll be writing about, including Church House in, near Westminster, where um, at least one of the women I was writing about spent VJ Day at a meeting of the UN War Crimes Commission. Um, the object that is going to be kind of a centerpiece for this talk is the front page of a French newspaper on 30 October 1946. You can see just from looking at a couple of the big words that this encapsulates, whether you knew French or not, Goering, atomic bomb, etc. it encapsulates a lot of what's going on at Nuremberg. The piece that um, is worth looking at first is this picture of a, a, a man, it happens to be Jean-Paul Sartre, who is the famous playwright, and it's an article about a, a caption saying that he is preparing a new play in France as his then famous play, 12 months old at the time, um, was about to make its Broadway premiere. And that play in French was known as Huit Clos. In uh, the British translation, which came out very quickly afterwards, it was called Vicious Circle. And the probably the best known, at least English title, is No Exit in the American um, translation. What's this story about? For me, it becomes a way to think about this moment. It opens with a man named Garcin or Garcine being thrown into a room. 
where he does not want to be and he soon discovers he cannot leave. While he's trying to figure out what's going on to him, suddenly another person is put into the room. Her name is Ines Serrano. And uh, immediately they take a dislike to each other. They realize that they are quite different. He holds himself out as the hero of a movement, a pacifist hero who refused to fight and was killed for doing so in Rio. And um, they have very little in common. He seems very educated, she doesn't. And while they're beginning to deal with their relationships, yet a third person is put into the room. She is different from both of them. Wealthy, elite, tasteful. She keeps talking about things being in bad taste. She loathes all swearing, even the mildest of curse words. And she not only doesn't belong in this room, she does not belong with these people whatsoever. The story, of course, is that they have to work things out. And they play at love triangles with different couples matching up and breaking up. They posture about how wonderful they are and how much they don't belong. They fight with each other. And in the course of the play, we discover that they're all lying and that they do deserve to be in this place, that they are monsters within. And the play reveals their monstrosities. Um, it turns out that the woman who is so wealthy and wonderful has killed her unwanted child and got away with it. She dies of pneumonia. The man, in fact, was a coward who fled when the war started and was shot as a deserter. And if anything, Inez is the least culpable of all because her only supposed crime is that she happens to love women and lured a married woman out of her home and into her bed and then is killed by that woman. Um, and so eventually, of course, they realize that they are in hell or a kind of hell and they are doomed to be there forever. And although they have all for their crimes been expecting the torturer to arrive, they realize that they must torture each other or find a way to live together. And so the play ends with uh, Garcin saying, ah, well, let's get on. Et bien, continuons. Let's get on with it. We could spend some time playing with who these are in the concept of the post-war moment. Who is France? Who is Britain? Who is uh, uh, Russia? Or might they be the three worlds as the post-war moment began to talk about? The first world, the third world, the second world. And who, after all, is the fourth often forgotten unnamed character known as Garçon, who is in fact the person who has the, the power to put them in the room. Dare I suggest that he's Bentham's panopticon? That he watches over them and decides their fate? Or is he possibly the rest of the world? All the other countries but the big four, who not only who can watch and indeed must watch what these four do and how they try to work out their power. Are they the other countries? Who are they? To examine those questions, um, I would like to talk in the frame of international criminal justice, as I have clearly stated. And my claim, as I said, is that it's about more than um, uh, putting people on trial. It is a cornerstone embedded in the post-war moment. What happens there is about the war, ending the war, and changing the order. If you look at the people in this room, almost all of them were in active service in the war, either as military personnel, male and female, or as civilians working somehow in the war effort. Otherwise, they didn't get to Nuremberg. You had to have done that just to get there. And so their experiences, the way they see justice, comes through the experience of having been victorious allies. Everyone at this time 
is embedded in the war. Indeed, Sartre is not accidental. It's not just that his play was published at the time, but in fact, uh, the man in the beret is his lead actor in the Broadway play who just months before the play had welcomed his partner back from her detention as a resistant from the Ravensbrück concentration camp. So the very camps that were on trial in Nuremberg he had uh, sadly intimate familiarity with. And then here we have a drawing of Sartre by Saul Steinberg, a famous New Yorker cartoonist, who meets Sartre as he goes to cover the Nuremberg trials. The trials, of course, were about putting people on trial. This is an article right after Goering, um, the lead defendant, has been condemned to death and, as they say, cheats the hangman by taking a cyanide capsule the night before he is to be hanged. And so this is a story about that, where um, it says that he wanted to die a martyr, that he wanted to write history his own way. And then, before we get too enchanted by those ideas, we are reminded that when asked about concentration camps, he laughed them off. He dismissed them with a laugh. They were unimportant, the, the, the problems of that. Nuremberg was not just about the trial. It wasn't just about convicting people. It was about some of the things that we hear talked about in this moment. It was about regime change. What better way to quell your enemy than literally almost to decapitate the leaders, to incapacitate them, to uh, uh, control the narrative about what regimes are good, what regimes are bad. We hear some of that being discussed at least vis-a-vis -vis personnel change with Putin today. This is an article by, of all people, Erika Mann, who was Thomas Mann's daughter and a war correspondent. Again, someone who had, in her own way, served during the war. And it is an article that she wrote for the Evening Standard, then a London newspaper, from Luxembourg, this fancy spa in Luxembourg, where the 52 top Nazis were held until the trial. And she goes to the defendants tells them of Japan's surrender, and then interviews them and writes the story. Why is she there? Why is she allowed to be there? Because even the Nazis wanted to meet Thomas Mann's daughter, and so they granted her an interview. But we see in this incarceration of something that was covered at that time with scaffolding and barbed wire and called the ash can, a visualization of part of the post-war project, which was to choose a certain kind of government over a different kind and to enforce that choice. Today, we see international criminal justice engaged in, if you will, security governance. Look at these entries from a recent uh, front page of the docket of the International Court of Justice. Almost everything deals with it, what we today we would call international crime or serious security measures. The question becomes how these institutions will handle this challenge, and that's something we can talk about in um, our question and answer. Another thing to remember about wars and post-war periods is that they have a huge effect on economics. And we see that here in this article in the bottom left which says the price of meat has just gone through the roof. And it's talking about the inflation, the privations that were being suffered in post-war Europe the first year after the war. It is underscored in um, some of the documents that I have uncovered in research. The woman who, quite appropriately for the women at Nuremberg, is surrounded by men. The balance of, uh, on gender, you might imagine, was pretty lopsided, is the only French woman lawyer on the prosecution team. And the background is a letter that her mother wrote her, and this is the excerpt from it. And her mother says, we haven't had newspapers for a week or two. 
which is a reminder of the breaks in the supply chain, the economic privations that they were suffering um, in the winter of 46, which happened to be one of the coldest winters of the decade to make things even worse. No fuel in the coldest winter of the decade. And then she asks her daughter about what's happening at the trial because she hasn't been able to read about it in the newspaper. This too has contemporary relationships. We know that what Nicholas Mulder in his newly published book has called the economic weapon has been in many ways at least for the, those same group of countries that called themselves the allies in the post-war moment has been the weapon of choice. Unprecedented sanctions. We need to ask the wisdom of that, the efficacy of that, and to look very carefully at, at, at the extent to which these work as a weapon. And as Mulder points out, because his book focuses mostly on economic sanctions in the first war period, first world war period, what are the knock-on consequences? Does the squeezing of the economy um, make your enemy dig in or quit? And as we're seeing right now in the West, what about the effects on the economy among your friends and how does that affect the resolve, the united resolve of the war effort? All this is at play at Nuremberg. In fact, many of the women who were lawyers at Nuremberg, um, the first and the subsequent trials, had worked um, in the, what was called during World War II the Bureau of Economic Warfare as civilian lawyers, gathering information, doing things like trying to cut off rubber um, supply to Germany and other things coming from Latin America. The last um, part of this paper that I think it's really front page that it's really important to focus on is um, the, the front page headline that says, Stalin, the USSR does not have an atomic bomb. And what this is, is a um, interview that one of the newspaper wire services did, written questionnaire of Stalin. And it asks him different questions and then publicizes his response. And so one of the questions is, the American Secretary of State has just said that relations between Moscow and Washington are getting tense. The tension is increasing. Do you agree? No, I don't. I would like to see a restoration of amicable relations much like we had during the war. Are you interested in expanding into Pol or not Poland, um, Finland, Norway? What are your interests in Yugoslavia? And essentially Stalin says in a very terse way, I have no interest in further conquest in Europe. And we're withdrawing troops. Anyone who says that we are keeping troops in Europe with evil design is lying. It's not us who are militarizing Europe. It's not us who are interested in further war. And as you see in the headline, he says it's Churchill who is the warmonger. And so what does that tell us? Well, first of all, it reminds us that the tensions of this moment had their seeds already sprouted at almost 80 years ago. And the, the tension then had roots at least to the Bolshevik Revolution. And so the, the kind of dynamics between these people who have found themselves in the room, which maybe could be called the P5 of the Security Council, um, have been pushing and pulling and posturing and presenting themselves as good as they do bad and vice versa about their enemies for a very long time. And that we have to lay the contemporary moment with its genuine contemporary issues. We have to understand that if we peel back a bit, that history is still there. <laughs>
that relationship, that sense of who I like, who I dislike, who I trust, who I don't trust, is still there. The other thing to really focus on is the significance of the atomic bomb to the Nuremberg moment. And I don't th really think this has been discussed very much. There is discussion of it with regard to the Tokyo trial. But for some reason, if you read the history, the conventional history of Nuremberg, it walls off the fact that the US Army did not see itself as the, the US Pacific Army and the US European Army. They did have, you know, branches, but there's only one US Army. And there was only one United States. And there was only one group of allies. And the dropping of the atomic bomb in Japan was not irrelevant to the post-war moment, even vis-a-vis -vis Europe. In fact, remarkably, in the same 24-hour period, which is sometimes called August 8th and sometimes called August 9th, depending on where you are in the globe, of 1945, the Nuremberg Charter was signed here in London. The Hiroshima bomb, or excuse me, the Nagasaki, one of the two, I'm blanking, I think it's Nagasaki, is dropped, and Russia enters the war at the very last minute against Japan in order that it can have a stake in the windup of the war in the Pacific. Nuremberg is created on the day that an atomic bomb is dropped. This is not discussed at this level. And so I hope that one of the things my research will bring forward is what was happening at the level here. In fact, remember Estelle, the wealthy woman? At one point, she complains about those people outside that put them in here. Not only because they're there, but they didn't like the choices. How did we have to, why do we have to fight with Russia after all? Right? That wasn't the US choice. It wasn't Russia's choice to fight with the US. It was a marriage of convenience, mutual interest. She feels that they've chosen badly by putting her in this room, and she blames it, and it starts word on subalterns. Right? And so part of what I hope is that by looking at what subalterns were saying, we may get a different story about what the participants themselves understood. And so I'll give you two examples of that. One is from an interview that I listened to on a disintegrating cassette tape um, at the Imperial War Museum here in London. And it is a couple who were both prosecutors at Nuremberg. And the issue of the bomb comes up. And the man says, at the time I was working in Paris, looking at seized documents on the day that the bomb was dropped, for the Office of the Strategic Services, which later becomes the CIA. And it raised much commentary, he says. In fact, at least one of the FBI agents who had been assigned to that task in Paris was so upset, he said, I cannot be part of a project that puts other people on trial when we do things like this. And he quit and went home. We don't hear that in the conventional histories. And many of the participants in different ways try to reason their way through that discussion. The other document that is really fascinating in this regard comes from a woman who was one of those US Treasury lawyers working on economic warfare. Um, and these are notes for a speech that she did many years later on her experience because she became one of the lead prosecutors in the later trial of the IG Farben slave camps. Um, and she writes here, this is all very speech-like civic club, despite the uneasiness of the time, no voice can be heard today in def defense of conquest, and no voice is heard to say that aggression is not a crime. So she's talking about the positive history legacy of Nuremberg, probably to some civic group. And then she scrawls a note for herself on a different page on the legal pad saying, would Roosevelt have been tried? And that too echoes 
questions about the atomic bomb vis-a-vis -vis Truman, but it also echoes the carpet bombing, which everyone understands the Allied carpet bombing also would have been considered an indiscriminate attack and a war crime at this time. At some point to win the war, all bets were off on humanitarian law. And of course, this is the central question with regard to the tribunal, or one of the central questions that no one wants to talk about with regard to this idea of an aggression tribunal. Should there be one? If this action on February 24th is not tested by a tribunal, some have said we should just stop talking about the crime of aggression. We just don't mean it when we say that it's illegal. And yet, will the countries who themselves sometimes do things that may deserve testing, will they establish a tribunal, a precedent that can come back at them? Justice Jackson famously said in the very first speech at Nuremberg, something to the effect of, we who are prosecuting these individuals here are handing a poison chalice even to countries like the United States. You too will have to live by the rules we establish here. We know that that's been a very fraught relationship. And we see that some of the participants understood at the time that this wasn't an issue. With that then, I think I would like to conclude simply by saying we've seen that in many different sectors, human sectors, economic sectors, um, certainly security sectors, certainly traditional ideas about justice and law, that Nuremberg is imbricated, as the crits would like to say, um, with the entire post-war security order. And learning about Nuremberg in this much more multi-layered way, exploring it in this way, is important, perhaps given the suggestion of a new Nuremberg Tribunal, essential if we are to understand the box that we found ourselves in and seem still to find ourselves in 77 years after the trial. Thank you very much. I welcome comments and questions. Well, many thanks, Diane, for such a wonderfully rich and thoughtful lecture. I think it really speaks, speaks to our contemporary debates in so many layers. And I think I was just uh, looking through earlier today um, on debates between some historians and the sense about uh, how uh, history is increasingly no longer a foreign country, if it ever was. So great questions of public international law, international criminal law. As they are noted, some uh, raised variously by people associated with uh, this institution, of course, uh, one cannot help but approve the Bentham quote. I think that is what we always approve here. <laughs> um, before I open it up for the questions, may I just remind those uh, coming in from the online audience uh, that questions can be sent via the <clears throat> Mentimeter link that you'll be able to find in the description uh, to the YouTube link. Uh, do I see any hands immediately being raised here? Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I, uh, I basically I, I had so many thoughts just pop into my head with the display of the um, of the newspaper cover that I found such a, an interesting tool for um, explaining your research, and I was I was caught by the idea of the object, um, and I'm wondering the potentials and limitations of working with objects because as it was framed in the in the screen, there was a big empty space next to it and you mentioned this character from the play that was outside. And I'm wondering, okay, is that character also present in this newspaper cut? 
where there are things happening outside of these, this newspaper that someone, some editor decided, I'm going to put this in this editorial. But you mentioned, for example, uh, food supply being scarce. This, is, this was a major concern of Latin American countries immediately after the collapse of the Morgenthau Plan and the start of the Marshall Plan. And they were ignored. Um, or uh, you mentioned the, the FBI agent that decides to quit the, the Nuremberg moment while at the same time we have the uh, Rap Habi Not Pals dissent in the Paris Tribunal. So I'm wondering, within your research, what role would that empty space next to the page, what's outside of the object, if that is part of the object, or if that is something that you're just going to frame, uh, you're just going to say, okay, I'm, I'm focusing on this object and that's it, or you're going to say, the choice of what ended up in this uh, newspaper is also part of the research. So I think that's really an excellent point, and it, it sounds a bit like Tanaya Zaria's research on state silences and the importance of silence is something uh, she and I are going to have a talk soon, so I'm looking forward to talking with her about that. Um, it, it's an interesting question, not least because to talk about women at Nuremberg is essentially to try to fill, fill the holes already, right? And so. Um, the, the women I showed you included three lawyers. One of them was at the very least, she was something like uh, the sixth woman in the history of France ever to do a PhD in international um, law. And she never could get a job in that. She practiced before the Paris Bar throughout the 1930s and did journalism to make money because no one would hire a woman to represent them. She ends up a colonial school teacher in what's now Vietnam before the war and through a bunch of strange circumstances finally gets to the trial that she's 50 years old, which is 30 years old than most, or 25 years old than most of the participants. And she has she was Manly O. Hudson's research assistant at one point and Salvador de Madariaga's research assistant at one point. She has incredible training and expertise. She um, drives as second in command one of the main aspects of the French case. And she doesn't have the title of lawyer throughout the entire thing. That was true of all the women. Uh, the other two had both done graduate work at Yale first in their class and had editor of the law review, all that kind of stuff. You had to be that to get there. But they're erased from the contemporary history. They did not have job titles acknowledging that they were women. And I have found, again, this is just I found pieces of paper where at least the Americans were admitted to the bar of the tribunal, but not one of the women was ever permitted to speak the entire time. The best they could do is sit at the table while a man read the brief that they had written. And so part of what I'm trying to do is fill those silences. And the, artic the, the newspaper articles, sure there are choices being made. In France, of course, at this time, all the newspapers are highly political. And so they're not going to write about certain things for that reason. But the linkage, I think, if you link up what's there, it's almost like a breadcrumb, the story about prices going through the roof to the letter where the mother's talking about, we don't have newspapers, we don't have fuel, et cetera. And so it begins to give texture to it. That's my hope anyway. It's, it, it becomes um, another way to, to uh, fill in the empty spaces of what has been, for me, a jigsaw puzzle kind of research. Um, so to pick on the, the point about silences, and aggression. Uh, obviously, you know these things much better than I do, but I wonder whether there's an interesting story as well to be told about relationship between international criminal justice and universal international organizations. And I think that in sort of in the immediate uh, first months of this year, I think at one point that has been made very rightly was about the role of the Soviet lawyers in formulating uh, the charge on aggression. But I think another contribution of sorts of the Soviet Union is as being the 
only state that was expelled from the League of Nations mm -hmm. after the invasion of Finland. And so I think that that is not uh, something that uh, comes up uh, in the trial, obviously, because of the um, ratione personae framing, and ultimately it is something that was more of a problem for League of Nations uh, rather than for the Soviet Union. And I wonder whether we could sort of also see the, I suppose, the germs of a certain uneasiness with which international criminal law, particularly on the topic of aggression, has been dealing with these matters, including particularly regarding aggression in sort of recent decades, where I guess the question about whether the Security Council holds the ultimate stop card was really one of the flashpoints. So I, I think those are, are great points. I think, I think, in fact, Italy was also expelled from the League of Nations when it invaded Ethiopia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I might be wrong. I thought that there was a bit of uh, an unpleasantness that uh, that the council ultimately concluded that it was up to individual states to draw their be. conclusions. That may be. Um, the, the point, though, one of the things that Mulder talks about in his book is that the treatment of Italy by the League, rather than um, the, the sanctions put on Italy, rather than encouraging compliance, seemed to just discourage further participation by other states, right? And so you do get this um, uneasiness, to use your word. International organizations always, they're in their own hostage situation, right? Because um, if they demand too close of compliance, they risk the departure of, of uh, those they would like to police, if you will. Um, and vice versa, the folks that don't like being told what they're going to do are going to make a living hell for everybody else if we use the mirror of the, the, the play. So um, I think it's definitely true of aggression, perhaps because essentially a finding that a state has committed aggression is a verdict, literally a verdict, on who was in the right and who was in the wrong. And that is a heavy burden that, that states caring about reputation don't want to have, right? But I think one of the things that comes out, the, the, the research that you're referring to is, is Professor Hirsch's research leading to her book called The Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, I believe it's called. Um, she has brought the Soviets into the story much the way that I'm trying to be, bring women in, and somewhat for the same reason. The Soviet records were classified and even when unclassified, largely unavailable to English speakers or Western language speakers, Professor Hirsch at the University of Wisconsin is a Russian expert and went into the archives and found things that hadn't been found because given circumstances in Russia, perhaps they hadn't been looked for. Um, and so few researchers could get into it. So I think you find that. Um, I would also say that it's quite well known that the Nuremberg Judgment has silences of its own as to even war crimes and crimes against humanity, particular incidents that simply don't get mentioned, carpet bombing. Of course, there's no charging either in the Nuremberg trials or in the trials conducted by the UN War Crimes Commission. They are all forbidden to charge the Allies with crimes, so that's a huge silence in and of itself. But aggression may be different because of the, the meaning of that verdict vis-a-vis -vis others. Right, so I suppose in, in technically boring terms that that would be the only point where criminal responsibility of an individual necessarily as a matter of definition presupposed responsibility of a state. That's right. Um, any other questions from the audience, please? Yes, please. <laughs> 
Well, certainly the hope of criminal proscription is that the naming of something as an international crime will itself have a deterrent effect. That it becomes much more difficult to say, oh, well, that was in the great, you know, if you think about um, business crimes, it's very difficult to attach too much stigma to, to it because the line between what is criminal business behavior and what is daring entrepreneurialism to be rewarded is really blurry. And often, when, even when there's a criminal prosecution, there are those who say, well, everybody does that or whatever. Um, so it doesn't always work. But the idea in international criminal law, because we're talking largely about crimes of conflict, is that to say, this complex of things that happens isn't just a, a thing that happens in war or happens at a time of serious uh, societal rupture. It's criminal. And you cross a line that cannot be crossed when you do that. I think of, um, for instance, a, a, a crime that I think we're going to be hearing more about potentially vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, which is the crime of enforced disappearance. You know, we've been talking about these forced deportations, but there is also a crime of enforced dis disappearance, which only evolved very recently out of the Latin American experience, when, when Latin American tribunals were trying to uh, describe as human rights violations a whole transaction of events. And it didn't seem to be enough to say, oh, well, but there was a bit of detention here, and there was a bit of that there. And, and the notion of enforced disappearance as almost a syndrome crime came up to name it and, and, and um, get rid of the fragmentation and sort of the diminution of the seriousness of it. So um, I think that the goal is by saying the crime of aggression, the crime of sexual slavery, the crime of um, um, forcible transfer of children as genocide. To name those things as impermissible in a criminal way is itself a, a call to states and other actors who care about their reputation to simply stop. Whether it works or not um, is a debatable question. You know, there, there was long a claim. I mean, even if you look at Ona Hathaway and Scott Shapiro's book, The Internationalists, which is only a couple years old, it seems like interstate armed conflicts have ended, right? Maybe the ban on those that began with the Kellogg-Briand Pact works because countries aren't going to war against each other anymore. Well, clearly, that may have been a premature or overly optimistic statement. Right. Well, I think the yes, gentleman in the last row, please. Can I give you a call? Um, could you just comment on the fact that since Nuremberg, there have been many instances of naked aggression which have not been prosecuted in any way or whatever, including economic sanctions, which are a form of war. For example, uh, the US sanctions on Iraq. Uh, Madeleine Albright, who died recently, was asked uh, about the deaths of uh, half a million Iraqi children. And her reply was it was a price worth paying. She was not condemned for that remark at all. Um, now, there have been wars of aggression uh, waged by several countries which we're all aware of uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and so on and so forth. There have been never, never been any calls for a war crimes tribunal to, uh, to uh, assess responsibility for the uh, consequences. Um, when when uh, when Khmer Rouge were in uh, in power in uh, Kampuchea, the Vietnamese army broke international law by putting an end to the killing fields. Vietnam was condemned for doing that because it was a flagrant breach of international law. So how do you explain the fact that Nuremberg was supposed to set a standard? which has been ignored ever since. So I, I think that was part of what I was trying to say with, with the use of the play, right? So um, if, if we think about the, the box as the permanent five members of the Security Council, 
many of the offenses that you mentioned were, uh, can be laid at the feet of at least one of those countries. And they work out their differences in a certain way. Um, and then perhaps the rest of us are on the outside. And how we can influence what they do, when we can influence, what pressure we can um, put on them is highly unpredictable and volatile. Sometimes it can be done, sometimes it can't be done. Um, the rules are different, and I think that also is a story of Nuremberg that doesn't always get told. That, you know, um, at Nuremberg, even at Nuremberg, and certainly at Tokyo, there weren't just four countries present. There were another dozen countries with diplomats around. And many of them were not treated very well or very seriously. Um, one of the American lawyers writes a letter to her parents saying, um, uh, Czech, the Czech diplomat uh, invited us to Prague. He is a difficult little man who caused us a lot of problems when we were all in London. And it's just very dismissive. Now, before we all begin thinking a certain way about Americans and Czechs, I want to flip that and say well, my research also, another Imperial War Museum tape, um, a secretary of one of the American lawyers, the delegation is invited to meet President Benesh in Prague, and he refused to have the two women secretaries who were working <coughs> legal, as legal assistants, he refused to let them into the room with the male lawyers. Um, his reason, which he was articulated, was women take too much time. You sit out here and you know you can go leave with them when it's time. So we have to remember these kinds of differences and valuations and devaluations of different kinds of people, nationality, et cetera, were present. There was a black contingent at Nuremberg that um, were the guards for most of the subsequent trials. And I think it won't be my research, but there's a dissertation to be read, written, excuse me, on blacks at Nuremberg because the interactions were not insignificant. There's a, there's a dissertation to be read on, written on Jews at Nuremberg. Anti-Semitism did not disappear because they were putting Nazis on trial. And again, the conventional wisdom has never wanted to talk about these things. And so Nuremberg is a place where those things were happening, regardless, as you say, that, that the legacy is something different. It's things like um, uh, other acts of aggression, uh, blatant violations of international law are not supposed to happen anymore because of that moment. But one of the things we have to understand is the moment itself was very fraught and emblematic of some of those same sort of divisions and things like that. Um, my answer to the question uh, that you raise is, is simply we need to keep calling those things out, right? That, that if, if Madeleine Albright was not condemned when she said that, that was the fault of everybody who can get on Twitter or somewhere else, not to say this is beyond the pale. I'm frankly quite surprised at that because as it happens, I went to her book signing when her memoir was published several years ago. I went to her book signing in San Francisco and it happened to be a bookstore that was three sides of glass, huge, huge floor to ceiling windows. And the, this being San Francisco, the entire windows, um, were peopled, little, literally peopled on the other side with people with signs calling her a murderer, et cetera, because of the then still, still ongoing sanctions in Iraq. So for her to have dismissed it that way when clearly she was hearing those complaints at the time is really quite surprising. Um, could I follow up perhaps from a slightly, to, to, to pick up the gentleman's point from a slightly sort of different perspective, uh, could we say that to some extent it's also 
that the international legal order, as we know, is fundamentally decentralized. And on many of these points, uh, we are looking for reactions and the way how international law and the consequences of flagrant breaches structured is that it is mostly structured in terms of rights rather than obligations. So International Law Commission has of course said a few things regarding obligation not to assist and not to recognize, but mostly it is really just the very general vector of lawful responses within international organizations. So fundamentally, it is a question of whether states are ready to engage in conduct that is costly for themselves. I think as you extremely nicely set out in your talk, that these are things that are not going to be harmful only to the responsible actor, but also for the injured actor and bystanders. And it seems to me that in retrospect, compared with the capacities of those not affected by 2003, uh, they were mostly rhetorical rather than taking advantage of the rights and entitlements that international law may have permitted them to have regarding the United States. So, would, would so I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and again, as a matter of public international law, the International Military Tribunal was itself an international organization founded by an international agreement. And um, the, the creators, even as they were trying to do something novel, protected themselves, right? And so we see throughout international law, decentralization, fragmentation, and, and whenever we look at a particular um, uh, site where international law happens, a particular treaty regime or something like that, we see over and over again that the states that have created it have in some ways done so um, almost with their fingers crossed behind their back, right? That, that if, if the statements in the instrument are bold and progressive in scope, then we discover there's no enforcement mechanism, right? That they, ca they can't actually be challenged for it. Or, um, and, and we see many human rights treaties, for instance, that are really uh, capacious in their care for humans and they make sure that any kind of body that can scrutinize or question let alone issue a verdict vis-a-vis -vis the behavior of states th th that mechanism is somehow bifurcated and states get a choice whether and to what extent they want to take part in it this is part of the reason why there's a call for an aggression tribunal between vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine-Russia conflict because although the crime of aggression is punishable before the ICC, it is only punishable for states parties that have taken a second step not only to join the court but then also to agree to, to be scrutinized by the court should they do something that could be considered aggression. That number is uh, today about 42 states compared with um, I think 121 states that belong to the ICC. There's almost 200 states in the world. So we see there's almost a funnel of responsibility where um, the, it, it can be very difficult to hold a state accountable if it does not want to be held accountable, particularly if it does not, um, if it has the power to enforce the rules of non-accountability, if you will. Right, but I wonder whether sort of response to the extent that we fall back on the decentralized um, aspects and, you know, sovereign equality might have its downsides, but one of the upsides is the capacity of all states, even smaller and militarily weaker actors to have certain jurisdictional entitlements, which I think many people would say would uh, cover as a matter of prescriptive jurisdiction, uh, capacity to have jurisdiction over certain international crimes like mm -hmm. aggression. And so I think that, that would be sort of the argument of saying that, um, at least on one reading of Nuremberg, that Nuremberg was the tribunal doing collectively what each state could do individually. 
of having the capacity. It's not clear to me that that was their theory. I don't actually. Well, uh, I, am, I did say s no, some I'm people. Would say. I'm a skeptic of the transfer of de delegation theory. I always have been, and that was a theory for the ICC as well. It was called an international military tribunal because it was a creature, in my view, of the laws of war. And that, in some ways, is talking about transfer of power, but it, 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 it's something different than that. I don't think it's that easy. Um, as for the question of whether and the extent to which states today can either confer jurisdiction or themselves exercise it, that's certainly possible. But one of the things you learn in Nuremberg is that many of the participants, particularly the powerful participants like Jackson, et cetera, very quickly moved to what we would call a universal ju jurisdiction by state's position after Nuremberg. They weren't interested in creating a permanent international criminal court. To the extent they still thought these crimes needed to be prosecuted, it was going to happen in, in states. That in itself is a way of reducing the potential for accountability because of the, the, the diplomatic international relations concerns that states have about exercising this kind of jurisdiction, even, even prescribing the crimes within their national codes, let alone um, pursuing international crimes, which almost inevitably involves somehow shaming or embarrassing or showing disapproval of high-ranking actors of another state. At the diplomatic arena, even to go to the International Court of Justice, until very, very recently, states were quite reluctant to um, engage in that level of, of uh, diplomatic discourse, if you will, because it, it is a reputational concern as well as sometimes a concrete concern should reparations or whatever be ordered. So um, universal jurisdiction is far more decentralized, but it also, um, maybe it turns off the spotlight compared with the international tribunal. One of the things that happens when you have an international court or hybrid tribunal or whatever, the media know where to show up. And it's going to be more than the media of the state that's prosecuting for a longer period of time. And maybe you lose that engagement with the public when you're beginning to create different, multiple, somewhat confusing, not a language we all know kind of sites for some of this dispute settlement. Um, absolutely. Well, and I think that there have, there's always a conference that has been there a few weeks ago about whether the future of international criminal justice is domestic or international. So, I, and I, incidentally, I completely take your point that Nuremberg was probably special uh, surrender uh, occupation, I think, possibly waiver, as it were, of claims by Germany preemptively right. and broadly. So I'm completely in that sense on the same page. Um, I think we have, a, we have a couple of questions, so just so as so our online audience does not feel that I have forgotten them before we are winding down. I, um, I have two questions at very uh, different ends of the spectrum of generality and specificity. There is one, um, a question about a more general one about what books you would recommend for uh, legal analysis of Nuremberg Tribunal and its consequences. So I'm sure that you should buy the book when it comes out and look at the bibliography, but perhaps we could ask for the top three. Um, and the very specific one, uh, by reference to your not President Benesh and his opinion about women in law, what about Dr. Bohuslav Etcher and his perspective in law professions? I don't know whether that is a question that falls within things that you have looked at. So um, 
Fran Hirsch's book, Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, is the most recent serious history of Nuremberg. I think it is well worth reading. I have not read it word for word because I'm at a place in my writing where I didn't want to be influenced with some, by somebody else's version of the story. I've tried to use the primary sources like those I've discovered um, and, and stay away from other people's comprehensive accounts because it's one hedge against um, not unduly taking on other folks' uh, ideas. But I've done a couple talks with her. I've read pieces of that book. It, it is definitely um, useful. I think um, one of the places to start is the memoir of Telford Taylor, known as um, a taught of, I think it's Anatomy of the Nuremberg Trial. It is in the genre of nonfiction for a general audience for the most part. Um, but that is, um, I think, a strength of it. It does take you through a full chronology of the trial from his perspective. Um, it also has anecdotes in it, so it keeps you reading. Um, and for someone who's utterly unfamiliar with it, it's probably a good first read. He was the number two US prosecutor at the first trial. Uh, Robert Jackson was a Supreme Court justice who was on leave for a year to be the number one US prosecutor. He left, and then Taylor became the number one US prosecutor for the following dozen uh, trials. And so he and then he was a professor, I think, at NYU, a law professor. So he has a lot of background. Um, and that's a great read. Those are the two that jump to mind right away. Um, I've been busy reading uh, memoirs that I have to get on sites like abebooks.com and things like that because they're out of print and um, not terribly well written. But the subaltern stories didn't stay in print. And so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, the question about Etcher, Etcher is the fellow that I mispronounced the name that the American woman lawyer thought was a difficult fellow. Um, and he was, in fact, a very accomplished Czech international lawyer, as I understand it, remained active in international law thereafter. Um, and the story of the UN War Crimes Commission is something that I've done some research um, in a recent blog post on. Um, and we need to understand that when an American calls him difficult, it's in part because the Czechs and the Poles in particular were the leaders in 1942 of a movement even to have war crimes trials. It didn't happen out of the largesse of the four major powers. It was countries like Czechoslovakia or the and um, Poland and others who had lost their countries to the Nazi occupation and their diplomats were living in London in exile who were pushing for accountability after the war. And initially, the British and the Americans, because of course France is still occupied at this time, um, so they're really not in a discussion. America and the US are very um, uncomfortable trying to get rid of the idea, and then finally felt that they couldn't. And so that's how the St. James's Declaration of 1942 occurred, which is the first statement that suggests that there may be trials. And so my guess is that the American lawyer's complaint that Etcher was difficult may mean that he also was effective, and that was difficult from the perspective of the American lawyer working with that commission. Right. and. Uh so it's interesting, I think, again, all these intersections, uh, because, of course, for um, interstate uh, people who are interested in the International Court of Justice, Etcher was the ad hoc judge uh, for Albania in the uh, merits and compensation stages of the Corfu Channel case. Oh, yeah, that I did not know. Uh, well, uh, at least, I mean, unless there are two Dr. Etchers, uh, famous no, international sure law, guy. at least, you know, to the extent that I yeah. could very diagonally read through the Czech version of his Wikipedia page. Uh, that seems to be the yeah. case. And of course, again, a case that did say tell us something about the use of force. Well, um, I think uh, 
if I could pose just the very last question and sort of some of the things that you said we might, might return to here as an appropriate concluding point. Um, so with all this appreciation of historical silences, erasures, sensitivities, um, old and new, and I think it's really fascinating how the nuclear weapons have been consistently there in the background. What is it that international law and institutions can do? So you mentioned, you showed us the page of the International Court of Justice. We spoke about the limitations of institutions there, challenges of having new institutions. Sort of where do you see the desirable direction for international law to go? I think one of the relatively recent developments um, that is already promising and holds promise <clears throat> is more public engagement. Um, it, it uh, you know, I think as, as you mentioned, uh, as special advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, I worked on children's issues. Um, there is within children's rights a serious attention now being paid to allowing children to participate in decisions made, um, even by international organizations, consultations, etc. Social media has created public engagement in a way that we have never seen. The International Court of Justice is live streamed live and there's live Twitter feeds of the arguments as they're happening with commentary by folks about, you know, why did so-and-so say that, that's not right, or I would have argued it this way. I think that's terrific because international law, as we all know, classically has been law between states and um, they are a certain kind of actor with a certain set of self-interests. And some of the kinds of excesses that we've been talking about I think perhaps cannot be um, self-policed. That was our question. And so then the question becomes, who is it that is going to um, stir the pot a bit or to push them in a certain direction? It's probably going to be the guy outside um, who is, is saying this is not tolerable. Even as to Ukraine, I think it, it is probably not an overstatement to say that, that the Ukraine war is in day 111 rather than having ended on day 11, in part because of the public outpouring of solidarity, support, outrage, etc that maybe that's what makes it different from some of the incidents that the gentleman in the back talked about. Um, and we can talk about what choices are made and who's being ignored, that's, that's a conversation for another day. But it had that feeling almost of a movement where people were willing to say, no, not this, not now, not this way. And that can be really powerful it makes states find their backs sometimes. They have to be engaged in it because there is um, the person on the outside, the fourth wall on the stage, if you will, that is becoming part of the discussion. Now that's incredibly disruptive and scary and unpredictable. Um, and how that gets managed um, is, again, a question for another day. Please join me in thanking Professor Amani in a customary manner. Thank you.